Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I welcome the right honourable member to her first Prime Minister's question time and congratulate her on her appointment and becoming the country's second woman Prime Minister? I, I hope that she will agree with me that this House and Prime Minister's question time should be an opportunity to debate seriously the issues that face our country and our place in the world. On the on the steps of Downing Street, she talked very eloquently about fighting burning injustice. Yet, Mr Speaker, her last act as Home Secretary was to shunt the Orgreave inquiry into the long grass. The Advocate General told the House of Lords that the IPCC told Home Office officials that if it announced any action to set up an inquiry or other investigation relating to Orgreave, it would have an impact on the Hillsborough investigation. The IPCC disputes that account. I hope Parliament wasn't misled, and will the Prime Minister now proceed with a full public inquiry into the terrible events at Orgreave? Well, can I thank the Right Honourable Gentleman for the welcome that he has uh, given me? Uh, can I uh, say to him, he refers to uh, uh, me as the second woman Prime Minister, I've, in my years here in this House I've long heard the Labour Party asking what the Conservative Party does for women. Well, <laughs> Us Prime Minister. Uh, I, I, uh, I welcome the comments he's made about Prime Minister's questions. We do debate serious issues in Prime Minister's questions. I, welcome to the, I look forward to the exchanges he and I will have, and I hope we will be having those exchanges over this dispatch box for many years to come. And as, as regards the Orgreave inquiry, I, I think the Shadow Home Secretary has an urgent question on that uh, uh, this yeah, afternoon, yeah. which the Home Secretary will be responding to. Yeah. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The new Prime Minister also said on the steps of Downing Street, if you're young, you'll find it harder than ever before to own your own home. In 1998, more than half of working households of people aged 16 to 34 were buying their own homes. Today, the figure is 25%, and the Resolution Foundation suggests this will fall to 10% in the next nine years. What figure has the Prime Minister set herself for home ownership amongst young people? I notice the timeline that the Right Honourable Gentleman referred to. He might have forgotten that during that period we actually had 13 years of a Labour government. 13 years of a Labour government that had a very bad record in terms of house building. This is the government that is going to change that. It's this government that is putting more into building more homes to ensure that young people do have a better opportunity to get on the housing ladder. That's why we're a government that actually will be governing for everyone in this country. Mr Speaker, that Labour government put a decent home standard in, in place in every part of this country. And I'm not sure that a 400. I'm not sure, Mr. Speaker, that uh, starter homes at £450,000 for young people earning 7% less than their parents' generation is actually a very good prospect for people owning their own homes. The Prime Minister is rightly concerned, Mr. Speaker, and she said this: "If you're black, you're treated more harshly than if you're white." So before appointing her new Foreign Secretary, did she discuss with him his description of black people as piccaninnies and why he questioned the motives of the US President Obama on his part Kenyan heritage? Well, the Right Honourable Gentleman started his question by making reference to the issue of starter homes and the upper limit in London of the £450,000, and I've sat on these benches and heard him raise that with my right honourable friend, the member for Whitney, when he was Prime Minister on a number of occasions. Can I just explain this to the Leader of the Opposition? If you look at house prices across the country, they vary. In Liverpool, the average house price is just over £116,000. In London, the average house price is just over £676,000. That's why we have a higher limit uh, for the starter home figure in London. If he objects to that, then he needs to tell his constituents why he is against them having opportunities to get on the house. 
refers to the remarks I made, and it is correct that if you are black, you will be treated more harshly in the criminal justice system. It's exactly why, as Home Secretary, I dealt with the issue of stop and search. I was concerned to make sure that nobody should be stopped and searched on the streets of this country because of the colour of their skin. I did that as a Conservative. 13 years of Labour did nothing on it. Mr Speaker, my question was actually about the language used by the Foreign Secretary. Earlier this week, the new Chancellor abandoned the Government's budget surplus target, as Labour has long called for. Her Government is already missing its targets on debt, deficit, welfare cap and productivity. Six years of Government austerity has failed. The long-term economic plan is clearly dead. Is there a new one? No, it's the, it's the long-term economic plan that has actually delivered the record level of employment that we see today. And uh, perhaps I could just uh, put the right honourable gentleman straight. Uh, we have not abandoned the intention to move to a surplus. What I have said is that we will not be targeting that at the end of this Parliament. But he uses the language of austerity. Can I just say this to him? He talks about austerity. I call it living within our means. He talks about austerity, but actually it's about not saddling our children and grandchildren with significant debts to come. And it's not about austerity, it's about ensuring we have an economy that works for everyone. Mr Speaker, jobless claims have risen for the fourth month in a row. Welfare claims have risen as well. Austerity actually means people being poorer, services being cut and local facilities being closed. In her speech on the steps of Downing Street, she also addressed insecure workers, saying you have a job, but you don't always have job security. Does that mean, does that mean to those people that are worried about their future in work, poor I'm talking of the people that sent us here to serve them. Does that mean that she's proposing to scrap the employment tribunal fees, repeal the Trade Union Act or ban zero hours contract as more than a dozen European nations have already done? That would help to give greater job security to many very worried people in this country. Again, I say to the, uh, the right honourable gentleman, yes, I did say that on the streets of Downing Street, and I think it's very important that us, that here in this House, we consider not only what might be called the more obvious injustices, but actually consider the life for those people for whom they are in work but struggling to make ends meet. It's essential. That's one of the one of the things that the government has been done has done has actually raised the threshold at which people start to pay income tax, for example. But it's also about making sure that we have more well-paid jobs in this country, which is also what the government is doing. But he, he refers, he refers, I'm interested that he refers to uh, uh, the situation of some workers who might have uh, some job insecurity uh, and potentially unscrupulous bosses. I suspect that there are many members on the opposition benches who might be familiar with an unscrupulous boss. Uh, a boss who doesn't listen to his workers? Uh, a, boss, a boss who requires some of his workers to double their workload. <laughs> a boss, and maybe even a boss who exploits the rules to further his own career. <laughs> Remind him of anybody. sent here to represent people and there are many people in this country struggling with insecure jobs with low wages i know this is very funny for all conservative members but i don't suppose i do not suppose there's too many conservative mp's who have to go to a food bank in order to supplement their family table every week i think we should reflect on those things the Prime Minister highlighted the failures of her predecessor on social justice, home ownership, education and the cost of living. 
Some might say that as a cabinet minister she too was responsible for that. But she empathised with working people when she said, I know you're working round the clock, I know you're doing your best, I know that sometimes life can be a struggle. Yesterday, the Institute of Fiscal Studies found that two-thirds of children living in poverty in Britain have at least one parent in work. What other than warm words is she going to offer those families, those children who are hungry often and very insecure in their living? Isn't it our duty to offer some hope and security to them? Yes, it is. And we are concerned about those people. But the answer is not the Labour Party's answer of unlimited, uncapped welfare for people. The answer to people who are in work and who are struggling in work, and the answer to those people who want to get into work, is to have a strong economy, an economy that delivers jobs and that delivers well-paid jobs. And that's why I can assure the Right Honourable Gentleman that on this side of the House, we are focused on building a country that works for everyone. That's an economy that ensures that everyone can benefit from the nation's wealth, a society where everyone gets the opportunities they deserve, and a democracy that everyone can have faith in. And finally, I would just say to the Right Honourable Gentleman, the Labour Party may be about to spend several months of fighting and tearing itself apart. The Conservative Party will be spending those months bringing this country back together. Yeah.